This video marks a turning point in the course. So far, we've been extending derivatives, first to parametric curves and then to scalar fields. Derivatives measured velocity, curvature, torsion, gradients, tangent planes. That's a lot to accomplish, but that's only half of the two main definitions of calculus. I'm now going to turn my attention to integration, starting with the integration of scalar fields. However, before diving into integration for scalar fields, I need to take a detour into the mathematical discipline of topology. What is topology? Well, it's a slightly strange discipline to explain. It is about geometry, but in a very rough and flexible way. It doesn't care about precise notions of distance and curvature, but with more coarse ideas of general shape. And even with that strange idea, topology starts with some definitions that seem pretty unusual, but I will try and motivate this. So think back to the real number line. The basic pieces of the real number line are intervals, and they come in two varieties, open and closed. The open intervals do not contain their endpoints, but the closed ones do. Surprisingly, this notion of opened and closed is actually the heart of topology. A lot of geometric information, particularly in higher dimensions, will depend on this openness and closedness of subsets. So what makes something open or closed? Well, to define this openness and closedness, I need some other notions, the notion of an interior and a boundary point. Informally, interior points are points that are inside a set, and boundary points are points that are, well, on the boundary. But I need a technical definition of this. This kind of technical definition calls, unsurprisingly, for epsilons. And in general, topology is very full of epsilon delta proofs and definitions. A reminder, epsilon in these contexts is always a small positive number that is used to measure that some point is close to some other point. So consider a subset A of Rn. A point is an interior point if there exists an epsilon larger than zero such that all points B that are within epsilon distance of A are also in the set. That is, I can draw a little region around A and stay within the set entirely. And a point C is a boundary point if for all epsilon greater than zero and two points both within epsilon of C such that one is in the set and one is not in the set. This is how I measure that something is on the edge. It is arbitrarily close to points both inside and outside the set. Let me draw this to explain the definitions a little bit. Here is a set in R2. A point is an interior point if I can draw a small circle around it and still be entirely within the set. A point is on the boundary if any small circle around that point will inter intersect with the set and with points outside the set. How does this all help? Well, interior points and boundary points are the way to properly define open and closed sets. Again, let A be a subset of Rn. A set is open if all of its points are interior points. If I can draw a small circle or ball around any point and still be inside the set. Equivalently, an open set does not contain any boundary points. Open sets are usually drawn with dotted or dashed edges to indicate that they don't contain their boundaries. And a set is closed if it contains all its boundary points. And this is usually drawn with a solid line to indicate that the boundary is part of the set. So let me talk about the most important open and closed sets in Rn, the ones that I will spend the rest of the ta course talking about and using. There are open and closed intervals in the number line, of course. I can take products of intervals, open or closed, and this produces rectangles or rectangular prisms. These are intervals in R2 and R3 and in higher dimensions in Rn. This notation means that the x-coordinate is between a1 and b1, the y-coordinate between a2 and b2, and the z-coordinate between a3 and a b3 for this interval in R3. The first of these is an open interval. It doesn't contain any of the faces, any of the panels of the rectangular prism. But the second is a closed interval. It does contain all of those edges and faces and sides of the rectangular box. In addition to intervals, 
There are also open and closed balls in R3, or in any Rn. These are also generalizations of intervals on the number line. So if V is a vector in Rn, then the open ball about V of radius R is the sphere, or higher dimensional version of the sphere, centered at R at V with radius R. And it is a solo sphere <laughs> it is a solid sphere, not a hollow sphere. Since it is open, the surface of the sphere is not part of the set. In the closed ball, the surface of the sphere is part of the set, and this is indicated by this overline, which is a pretty common notation for something being closed.